Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, our speaker is uh, Fatima uh, Hossein Nouri. She works here under my supervision in the astrophysics group. And uh, let me just introduce, I, I think still you all know Fatima, but for, for people who don't uh, know her, she did a uh, MSc and PhD in physics and astronomy at the Washington State University in the United States. Uh, originally, she is from Iran, and she worked uh, later on uh, as an assistant faculty at the Washington State University, and then as a postdoctoral fellow in Ayuka uh, Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Pune, India. And she was also science project consultant for LIGO India, uh, gravitational wave interferometer. And since uh, three years. So far, she worked here uh, in uh, CFT in our group, and she will present us today the um, results of her research about gas rich environmental effect on gravitational waves from LISA for extreme mass ratio black hole binaries. Thank you very much for uh, the contact introduction. Um, and thank you all for uh, being here today. So, uh, today I'm going to present uh, our recent project that we had at CFD about the gas rich environmental effects on the gravi uh, gravitational waves uh, detected future in, for future detections of LISA. And uh, so you can find our work in the archive as already submitted to journal. So let me start. Uh, okay, let me just uh, start with an introduction about the uh, our gravitational wave observatories. So I'm sure all of you heard about LIGO and its all recent uh, gravitational wave detections in recent years. So uh, LIGO is basically uh, is a laser interferometer. It's got two arms. Uh, each arm is like two, uh, four kilometers. So uh, LIGO was started actually back in uh, 90s. That time it was. It was a very ambitious project, and NSF actually labeled it as a high risk, high reward project. And so later, uh, finally, we had the first detection back in September 2015. I was a PhD student at that time. It was a very exciting moment for all the people actually in the field. And uh, so later, we had the uh, European Virgo just. Um, we joined uh, a bit later, and uh, we also had the Japanese Cobra, uh, which was operational back in 2020. Right now, we have LIGO India uh, under construction, which is expected to uh, join the club by 2030. And right now, we have the first observational round of LIGO. Uh, started back in uh, May 2030, and we are obviously in the middle of it. And we for this observational run, we have LIGO, Virgo, and Cagra. All right. So with, um, for the uh, ground-based observatories, we are limited to you know the Earth and it's also the infrastructure that we have to build uh, on our planet. But let's imagine we have just uh, you know take this laser interferometer to space. In space, we have no limits. So. We are not limited by the size of the planet. And so we can basically have a very huge gravitational wave detector. So basically, uh, back in, uh, I think, 2000 something, I don't remember exactly, but uh, Lisa and, uh, so uh, NASA and uh, um, ESA uh, actually started uh, this collaboration to build uh, the uh, laser interferometer antenna. Which was a very actually ambitious project. It was supposed to uh, be a, like a, this, you know, uh, triangle shape of the laser interferometer in a space. Um, we, it, the, the length was supposed to be actually like uh, five million kilometers. But of course, in the space, we don't have like a, a spatial limit, but we are still limited with the financial resources. So unfortunately, this ambitious project was somehow canceled back in 2011. Uh, I think those times there was a kind of a competition in the budget of uh, these um, um, 
James uh, Space Telescope and also this uh, the Vista. So uh, I guess that was the main reason that they actually they dropped the project. But Lisa also <laughs> had a resurrection after that. Uh, so the European Space Agency uh, decided to downsize their uh, project. And uh, um, so now it's supposed to be like this. Um, we had this uh, tri triangle shape of the interferometer where uh, with, uh, like each side is supposed to be like 2.5 million kilometers uh, length. So uh, this, this one sounds doable. And uh, it's planned to launch in 2034 or 35. Okay, so with Lisa, of course, we can detect lots of gravitational waves from different sources. Uh, for LIGO, we mostly limited with the gravitational wave coming from the mostly from the stellar mass objects like uh, like um, neutron star black hole mergers. But with Lisa, we can actually have uh uh actually uh we can go to different range and we can actually cover gravitational waves coming from like uh supermassive black holes and there's still like some overlaps of the compact uh binaries that we are we expect to observe uh, for instance why your binary is something we kind of expect to uh, observe by Lisa there's also this compact object captured by supermassive black holes so it's uh, this is actually why we're interested for uh, today's subject, uh, for today's talk. And, and uh, so what we call it is the extreme mass ratio. So when we have a supermassive black hole and uh, we have a smaller massive object, it can be like a secondary black hole, you know, with the lower mass uh, orbiting uh, the primary black hole. Okay, so. Can I have a question? Sure. Uh, what would be the range if the original idea was uh, implemented, like the NASA and SR uh, collaboration? Do you know, like uh, the, the, the the plot that you showed from the previous slide? Um, uh, the, the, this, because this you from like the phase parameters, is it like referring to the old design, new design, or it doesn't matter? I suppose this is what, like the updated one, so it's supposed okay. to be made for the newer one, like the new version. But uh, uh, this fact of two is not really that big changer in the game. Okay, right? yeah, I guess. It's one fact of two, yeah. and it's a logarithmic scaling, so yeah. it's all bound to the scaling. Yeah, yeah, of course, we have better sensitivity for us, but uh, still like covering the same kind of objects. Okay. Okay, uh, so yeah, here uh, we focus on this extreme um, extreme mass ratio uh, type of uh, merger. And uh, so we know that, uh, okay, so this uh, supermassive black hole is actually in gravitational waves, but this kind of binary system are not in a vacuum, but they are usually <laughs> actually inside the accretion disk uh, at the center of ga uh, galaxies and so here are some examples of these uh, observations. And pardon, can I can I ask something? Sure. So supermassive uh, black hole, how how heavy is that? How many uh, solar masses? Something just, just between small. yes, ten to. We have like a low mass supermassive black hole, usually ten to the four to ten to the five um, okay. solar mass. But when it goes beyond like 10 to the uh, 6 solar mass and even bigger than that, it would be like a usual supermassive black holes. And it can be a super, super massive, like you would know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be the heaviest <laughs> black hole that was uh, detected. Not 10 to 9, no, 10, 10 to 9, 9 I think. Was, yeah. 10, 10, 10 to 9. 10 is already at the edge of what you can have. 3 times 10 to 9 is really normal. Ah, uh, it's really normal. Yes. Okay. And why ten to ten? So, if I'm not referring to that, why ten to ten is the maximum? That you there is no maximum. There is no maximum. Observation. 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 Okay. So not by physics, but no, no. by observation. Thank you. Um. Okay. So yeah, this this uh binaries are usually actually so inside the equation disk. and uh, so there was like a recent study that suggests that this gas environment can actually 
uh, put some, you know, uh, effects in the gravitational waves, and we can uh, detect it by future uh, with the observatory. But so all these previous works actually simplify, uh, you know, the problem too much. So they just use this analytical, very simple analytical model uh, from the seen this uh, of the Shakura Sinai of this, which actually they assume some sort of like artificial constant, what they call it alpha viscosity, uh, with a typical value of uh, something between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1, which represents the angular momentum transfer in, in the equation this at acting that viscosity. Uh, but here, actually, this project, we wanted to kind of challenge this uh, kind of models. And so we thought, okay, so let's actually have a thin accretion disk and put uh, magnetic fields in it. And with this, uh, actually, magnetorotational rotational instability, we can uh, actually make this, the disk turbulent and we can provide some physical mechanism. Uh, I would say real mechanism for the turbulence and for the viscosity. So uh, with this realistic model, we can quantify these alpha viscosity values. And um, so we can also actually observe how it's evolved by the disk evolution. So we can have a more realistic picture rather than just a very simple constant alpha model. So that's the motivation. So um, uh, we basically have uh, like a few uh, magnetized accretion disk uh, simulations, and uh, so we use this GRMHD harmful curve. And uh, so uh, we have two dimensional grid for our main um, simulations with this resolution. And um, so, as you see, so here's this actually the initial configuration of the density and also the magnetic fields. And so we play around with like different quantities such as, you know, uh, beta, which is, which represent actually uh, this uh, ratio of the gas pressure to the maximum of the magnetic pressure. And uh, so which represent actually how magnetized the equation is. is. So basically lower beta means more magnetized uh, this. And we also have different Values for M, M is this inclination uh, parameter for the magnetic field configuration. So, uh, higher M basically means more like vertical shape or like higher uh, inclination angle for the initial magnetic field. Lower M is more like this more radial um, configuration. And we also alter uh, the black hole spin as well. So, we have like some moderate high spin and also like a uh, highest spin case. Um, and yes, we are showing this beta value. Basically, we have two highly magnetized cases and two low magnetized cases. Okay, so now let's see how, how the system is actually evolving over time. So, how can I play this? Okay. So as you see, um, so uh, after a while we have the magnetorotational instability being triggered, and as a result we have uh, turbulent structure inside the accretion disk. So this is actually for for uh, one of the cases with actually highest mean and uh, lower inclination angle. So uh, it's kind of interesting actually. So at the end uh, we have still have some like. The, the thin structure of the disk is still there. And we also have some like mysterious inner torus being formed uh, with the magnetic field looping inside this, which can be actually have some observational effects, but uh, we, we should do more on investigation on it. And so this is like how the disk look like, uh, looks like. And uh, okay, let me. Okay. So here uh, I'm showing how um, this actual model looked like at the at the very end of the simulation. So more and less uh, for the all these actually um, uh, cases with uh, low inclination angle for the magnetic field, we have similar behavior, almost like have the thin 
uh, structure uh, this, uh, on the equator and also this uh, inner torus. Actually, it's sometimes it's sometimes it should have like the, as a multiple loops. And uh, only the case actually with higher inclination angle uh, it behaves totally differently. This one uh, actually has like expanding vertically with more like vertical lines at the end and uh, it seems that some sort of magnetic barrier is actually being formed here. So because it's uh, it actually moved to like matter state or magnetically aerostatics. And uh, so yeah, basically um, different parameters show different the sort of uh, behavior um, for the evolution. Okay, so uh, we claim that we want to measure the output viscosity uh, caused by the MRI, by magnetic rotational instability. So first we should investigate that how much MRI we have in our simulation. So, okay, so uh, we have, we need to have some, you know, there's some numerical condition and there's some physical condition to have sensitivity. For the numerical condition, we usually need roughly around like 10 grid points along the uh, past the, along the wavelengths of the passes growing mode of the um, uh, MRI instability. And uh, the physical condition is basically this one. So if the, uh, the uh, passes growing mode wavelength is actually greater than the scale height of the distant, MRI is, is suppressed. So to have MRI, so this lambda should be actually less than H. Uh, so here we are examining our models uh, for this condition. Uh, also, like uh, presenting this um, actually surface density for each case at final snapshot. So uh, here uh, we see that again for for like uh, these three cases uh, with the like uh, radial uh, configuration for magnetic field uh, at the inner part where this inner torus is being formed. Uh, we had this long MRI actually exceeds the scale height, the height of the disk, so MRI is suppressed at, at this inner region of the disk. And but yeah, MRI is actually active uh, at the end, and uh, I mean at the like la larger radii. And okay, so this is also from the surface density. It is actually very obvious that this inner torus is being formed, and. Um, of course, like these, the uh, the other cases actually totally different. And so we have like accretion kind of stuff, and uh, the density is much lower compared to the other ones. Um, and the other, okay, so the other uh, scenario, of course, when MRI is not there, uh, another possible scenario is the magnetically arrested. So it means that the magnetic field lines is the magnetic field is actually too strong, uh, which can suppress the magnetic rotational instability. So for this purpose, we usually actually measure this ratio of the magnetic flux with the mass flux at the horizon. And when it's actually uh, greater than 15, uh, it somehow actually shows that uh, this turns into the matter state. And again, for uh, the blue curve for the uh, high inclination uh, uh, initial magnetic field configuration, we see that um, even in the, from the very beginning, the, this actually turns into the matter state. So uh, that's kind of a possible scenario that maybe we don't really have any MRI active for, for this kind of uh, disk evolution. On the other hand, we see that as the, the disk turns into the matter state, uh, the accretion rate actually drops significantly comparing to other cases. Uh, by the way, this, like most cases, have like uh, this accretion rate um, standing upper than 10% of this Eddington limit. So it's mostly like Eddington ratio is like 0.4.5. And okay, so. Okay, so the next step would be measuring the alpha viscosity, uh, which we computed uh, from the stress energy tensor uh, uh, within the general relativistic formalism. So we need both like Reynolds part and Maxwell part. So here we define these uh, components like this, uh, with all the symmetric components and everything. So um, we have, uh, okay, so we have these 
uh, volume average and also the estimated um, one uh, alpha measure uh, for uh, like different cases here. We show it here, and this is actually a comparison between the oops, between uh, the um, uh, the Maxwell component and the Reynolds component, and so we see that the Maxwell component is actually the dominant part of the alpha uh, viscosity. And comparing the models, so uh, now we exclude actually the, the blue one because that is actually this is a mad disk end, so it doesn't have much MRI. Uh, but here uh, we can see that this alpha can actually. Of course, it's growing as the magnetic field is actually exponentially growing by MRI. And um, so at high value, it's reached, it's reached to something like even higher than 0.3. But let's assume only like this second half of the evolution when we kind of make sure that uh, the disk is turbulent up to like um, 200 uh, gravitational radius. So the average value we found is actually something between 0.1 to 0.2 or 0.25 uh, at this time of the evolution. And uh, so compared to the analytical models, the analytical model usually actually gives the alpha equals to 0 0.01. So what we measure is like order of magnitude here. And this is the, still kind of actually uh, a debate in the, um, numerical simulation this value of alpha because the in the for instance sharing box models is usually actually the value is quite low it's like 10 to the minus two but for this uh more like the global uh simulation of the equation is but this one is usually bigger so uh, it can yeah go uh, even beyond point one um so yeah and the last one is showing uh, this uh, time average of alpha viscosity uh, versus the radius. So here we see that the, like the inner part where the MRI is suppressed, uh, we uh, don't have much uh, alpha viscosity, but uh, so the value of alpha can reach to like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, at the larger radius. So it's, it shows that the alpha uh, depends on time and also depends on the radius. So. I should be measured really carefully. Okay, so now let's move on to the viscous torque. So here we kind of switch to analytical models. So we use the what we found the alpha scan from our numerical simulations, and uh, we uh, try to estimate the viscous torque from the the analytical one D model. The reason is because we don't have the second black hole. So uh, our secondary black hole is somehow hypothetical. So we kind of just uh, estimate, you know, this viscous torque or this environment effect uh, using some sort of uh, analytical estimation. So we use that uh, actually this uh, general relativistic um, uh, equation given by um, Shapiro back in 2013. Uh, so he derived this uh, actual formalism for this, uh, for the viscous torque and so compared to the Newtonian measurements, you see it's more complicated. It uh, depends on all this, you know, uh, coordinate values in the boiling quiz, um, for instance, um, coordinate system and uh, like uh, also the spin of the black hole. So, uh, and by the way, uh, for comparison, we found that uh, this uh, the relativistic torque is actually uh, somehow like 20% lower than the Newtonian one. So the Newtonian calculation basically overestimates the value of the torque. And okay, so the exciting part would be uh, compare this, you know, viscous torque or this, you know, this environmental effects actually with the with the gravitational wave torque. So for the gravitational wave, you know that also uh, this uh, while the binary system is emitting gravitational waves, it's losing the angular uh, angular momentum, and so we can define. Um, this gravitational wave torque like this, uh, with this, it's, it's again, it's not some simple assum assumption, but it's good for uh, our approximations. And okay, so um, here we show the ratio of this uh, torque, basically. This is the uh, ratio of the viscous torque to the gravitational torque. And uh, so here we plot it versus the radius. 
And we see that at some radii, some like larger than uh, 100 uh, gravitational radius, uh, this ratio can reach to values some like 10 to the minus two. It means like the, the environment effect is like 1% of the gravitational wave effect. So it's that big basically. And from this estimation, we can measure uh, the phase shifts uh, that can appear in the gravitational waves. So again, by some uh, calculations that uh, to estimate, for instance, the gravitational waves, uh, you know, affects the, the orbital, uh, the orbital separ separation, and also the one coming from the torque, we can estimate uh, the phase shift. Um, of course, we need to do some actual kind of scaling here. So uh, here we assume that, okay, so the primary black hole is a 10 to the 6 solar mass, and the secondary one is the 10 to the third, uh, 10 to the 3 solar mass. Uh, and so at the red shift of one, uh, so we kind of uh, estimate to have the gravitational wave frequency around one millihertz. So here, just like a very handy <laughs> calculations, uh, we finally got to this number that we can uh, basically expect about 10 radians for about, yeah. in about 10 to the five in spiral orbits. So 10 radians space should will appear in, in the list of um, gravitational wave detections. And which is about like five, four to five years of observational time for Lisa. Okay, so the, other important thing is actually the fluctuation of the torque. So there was some recent work um, uh, that published this year that kind of actually claimed that not only the this viscous torque can be observable in the future uh, list of detections, but uh, we can also observe the fluctuations of the torque and, and we can use it to prove the accretion properties. So. Here we didn't really have a, uh, uh, just uh, an accurate measurements because again you don't have the second perturbator, but um, but we could just observe, for instance, uh, this uh, viscous torque. So here we're showing this uh, the ratio of the viscous torque to the average values that we present in other uh, figures. That we see the fluctuations can be very dramatic. You know, here is actually for different two radius that I'm showing. Um, so uh, sometimes it can even just be like five times bigger than these average values, or um, it can also even have a, like a uh, like negative values, or uh, I mean like has a different sign. So it means that instead of like doing that, the shrinkage of the orbits, it can do the expansion. Um, so. Again, in future, in future um, simulation, it's really important to study this. And of course, it, it, this, this uh, kind of like uh, negative values, for instance, coming from the, the fact that we measure this alpha viscosity from the um, uh, stress energy tensor, that sometimes, yes, because of the turbulence, we can have negative values. Um, okay, so now someone might ask, uh, okay, what if uh, we had uh, a, a 3D simulation because you know when we are talking about MRI, it's really important to uh, be careful about resolution, about like this uh, accuracy of the magnetic field evolution, and there is this also this anthrodynamic theorem, which means uh, which says that uh, okay the magnetic field will dissipate if we assume axisymmetric assumptions. So for very long simulations, the magnetic field will disappear gradually and uh, uh, based on this theorem. And uh, so we should be careful when, when we are dealing with 2D simulations. So first of all, the resolution should be uh, high enough. And uh, second, is actually uh, should, the simulation should be actually short enough to avoid this uh, anthrodynamo uh, effect. So uh, for actually to evaluate our results, uh, we have uh, three simulations with a moderate resolution and also one one the higher resolution. And um, so, of course, for the uh, total evolution of the disk, um, uh, I would say yes, it's like the dynamical evolution is very different for three D. So here I'm showing uh, the movie from the three D simulations.
So at the end, um, that this is actually has lower density on the equator. And uh, there is no actually very um, like a very obvious sign of form the formation of the inner torus, and um, so and also you can see from here, for instance, comparing this ratio of the magnetic uh, flux to the mass flux, you see that this three D is actually this ratio is actually like uh, increasing gradually, and at the end. But somehow it's going to turn to the like this uh, magnetic arrested status, but uh, it's not really clear. Maybe if we evolve it longer, actually, we can see this 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 turn to the matter state. But uh, the story was different for the like the two D that we see that they uh, basically both the standard resolution and the higher resolution turns to uh, like matter state very frequently. Yes. Uh, okay, so if I understand correctly, you have a 3D uh, simulation where everything kind of works, but in 2D you have this anti dynamo effect which mm -hmm. like, messes it up. Can you, based on that knowledge of how the 3D simulation behaves, introduce some constant artificial factor to 2D simulation to stabilize it? Uh, yes, and I think some groups actually are doing that. Oh. They, they add some like sort of artificial term to the magnetic field evolution, okay. actually avoid um, this issue. Yeah. So yeah, there are some tricks to avoid because uh, you know when you have two D, of course, you can use this advantage of like a very high resolution, yeah, yeah, yeah. but in three D, you are very limited, of course. And uh, yeah, but okay. So basically, yeah, here we just wanted to have like a, some sort of simulation to actually kind of confirm our two D simulation. And uh, yeah, so it's again for the accretion rate. You see that the accretion rate is. Somehow constant, uh, it's dropping a little bit at the end, but yeah, totally like the in terms of like the matter state and the also the accretion rates, we see different different behavior between 2D and 3D. But it's interesting that uh, when we me measure this, uh, you know, average alpha viscosity, if we ignore this uh, like first uh, part, is like the first half of the evolution for the second half. We see that the actual results agree very well, so we can claim that the, our alpha measurements is actually uh, good enough um, to present a realistic view for alpha. Um, okay, so okay, that's it. So I uh, move to conclusion. Uh, so here. And in this project, we found that the initial magnetic field configuration plays an important role to trigger and sustain MRI or suppress MRI and turn the disk into the matter state. Uh, we observed that the density weighted volume average alpha viscosity varies around 0.1 to 0.5, um, uh, which is uh, higher than the analytical models. Alpha viscosity changes by orders of magnitude at different radii. And the MRI is suppressed at the inner part of the disk in two dissimulations, and, and a thick hot mini torus is formed, um, which doesn't appear, of course, in 3D. And we applied uh, the numerical results from the GRNC simulation to estimate the viscous torque using the uh, one uh, dimensional uh, GR hybrid approach. And we found that the time average viscous torque can be as large as 1% of the gravitational wave torque. Uh, for the mass ratio of 10 to the minus 3, around some like, uh, yes, this radius of 100 uh, gravitational radius. So this extra torque from the environment appears as a phase shift in the gravitational waves. It is around 10 radians uh, in 10 to 5 orbits. And monitoring the viscous torque at different radii shows that the fluctuations in the torque values may change dramatically and even sometimes it changes the torque sign and deviate from the average value by factor of few. So this is also another important thing for the future studies. Uh, so for uh, future, of course we have, uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, so we need to do some like 3D, uh, higher resolution and uh, develop it longer time, uh, of course for uh, like uh, for better and higher accuracy. Uh, and we should, uh, Add this secondary black hole as a third grouper. 
So it's, it's actually possible without having the met live metric in our simulation. So this, this perturbation technique can actually help us to do that. And it, we should do actually this direct measurement of the gas torque uh, from the general relativistic um, equations like this. So um, um, our estimation is only like put for like order of uh, magnitudes. And uh, so of, of course it's important to do some free analysis on the fluctuations. And because we need to basically measure the disturbance fluctuations and also perturbation fluctuations separately. And uh, based on that, we can make predictions on the uh, future uh, police detections. And uh, finally, I should just actually remind ourselves that uh, this MRI is not the only physical mechanism for uh, actually um, extract the angular momentum and creates environmental effects. So there are some other mechanisms. So this uh, well-known uh, limb blood or rotational resonance torque uh, is of course very famous. So it means that if we have a spiral arms inside the equations and they rotate at the same frequency as the, as the secondary black hole, there would be some resonance coupling between them. And that would extract the orbital energy, and we have some angular momentum transport. The other uh, one is this horizon flux, which is pure uh, general relativistic effect. And again, it's another kind of coupling, but this time uh, we have some sort of vibration in, at the, uh, in the horizon of the primary black hole, which couples by the tidal uh, field of the secondary black hole. So if they couple, Again, there was some, some sort of resonance happening again that would extract uh, the orbital energy and again, it would uh, affect this uh, orbital evolution of the binary system. So again, it would be important to study all this actually separately. The, the first one can be actually explored in numerical simulations, but I didn't really see any kind of um, numer numerical simulations actually study this, I think we still need to do some linear perturbation um, studies for that because I think it's really, it would be expensive to resolve all the horizon, and, you know, and all the vibrations. So, but yeah, it would be interesting to actually compare all these effects. All right, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> presentation and being on time, so we have time for questions. I heard recently a talk from a person who wanted to test the departures from GR using the shape of the of the gravitational wave in spiral. Uh, you also have a departure from the standard thing. So do you think that those two effects can be somehow Disentangle because your effects are more at, at the preliminary stage. Departure from GR, maybe it's, it's in the la latest stages, but I'm not sure. This is a question for you. Uh, that's a very good question, and that's really the messy part of, of this. Yeah, it's uh, because, yeah, this uh, the people actually working on the modified gravity theories. I kind of hoping to use distance spiral uh, waveforms to actually uh, see how uh, they are deviating actually from their like their predictions from their general relativity. But unfortunately, at the same time, they are they are also affected from the environment effects. So I think it's really hard to actually distinguish these two. And so yeah, this is this is kind of a disadvantage. We can use, of course, uh, this kind of analysis to study accretion disk, but uh, unfortunately, yes, it actually affects things. If I can comment uh, on that, I was on a conference uh, in August on the European Physical Society. So mm -hmm. there were physicists, and one session was devoted to modified gravity theories, and one talk especially was, was about this, gravitational waves in modified gravity theory. And there was a question from the audience about accretion disk environmental effects. And the speaker said, oh, no, no, they are much more advanced <laughs> works. We have only preliminary results, and our results are giving very tiny contributions. So 
I would not worry about that. <laughs> no, and I agree that it's not clear we have any departure no. from, from, from GR, while we surely have uh, those effects, or we will have those effects. Yeah, at least, yeah. I think, yeah, well, accretion disks are definitely confirmed. Yeah, they exist. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Okay. Question again about this uh, comparison between 3D and 2D simulation. Because I didn't get whether the problem is that in 3D the simulation is not syntropy symmetric and there are some efforts which are clearly not included in 2D and uh, mm. uh, this is the main problem. Or there is some maybe physical effect, another one is captured by 3D but not by 2D. I don't see what's the main source of the discrepancy. I don't understand it really. What do you mean, like? Shown that, uh, well, basically, the that the and, I think that is not properly does not work in two D. To get uh, the dynamo mechanism, you need three D because okay. you have to fold the field. Line. So just in the gas yeah. yes. no field is frozen process. into gas, and if this gas moves in the equatorial plane non-symmetrically, then the field can direct this gas in a different uh, azimuthal angles. And we could observe a different structure, especially close to the black hole horizon, when when these field lines uh, are closer to each other. Yeah. Yeah. It, it somehow it's like this magnetic field is fading away. You know, it's like when you have two D simulations. Okay. Well, it wasn't clear to me what is the main mechanism of using that. Yes. Yes, I have a personal question uh, with the, uh, about the mini bars. So uh, this is uh, like a real effect of your 3D simulations, or is it only seen in 2D? Uh, that's a good question. Let me actually show you this other maybe. Mm. I have some uh, like backup. Uh, I think you have to go with okay. me. Um, that's this last the slide. So, so yes, yes, this one. Oh no, 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 This is the last one, or is it? Oh. No, it's the very last. So, After conclusion, no, no, yes, so yes, yes, back up up slide. Slide. yes. Like backup ones, <laughs> and uh, no, the one after it. Actually. This is this is uh, also, also like this equatorial actually movie yeah. from the security simulation. So, yeah, I wasn't sure if it's good to have, put lots of movies on <laughs> so yeah, for the <laughs> for the back of slide. But okay, so the, this is again the same actually. Okay, so this is I kind of actually zoom in to this in our part to see what's going on. It seems that it's actually appearing only in 2D simulations. Uh, but okay, let me play this one maybe. Uh, this is actually for, for uh, this two-dimensional higher um, resolution. So, it's actually so yeah, if you magnify it seems that there are like a multiple loops actually yes. being created. And uh so what I think maybe the best explanation I found for this is, is um it's a combination of actually multiple things. It's a combination of this mad state and also like uh magnetic field actually like being trapped inside the plasma. So, because of the matter state, we have uh, active MRI at the like larger radii, but MRI suffers at the inner radii. So the matter is actually just pushing towards the black hole. But here we are uh, somehow have this you know formation of the magnetic barrier. So it somehow stops this uh, accretion and it makes the matter actually piling up at this area. And at the same time, you have the magnetic field actually <laughs> kind of start looping inside this uh, plasma. It seems like, like it, it's being trapped. It, 
we can call it plasmoid, but I better actually not be like 100% uh, uh, confident about it, but it's, it's somehow the plasmoid structure. So I think, yes, both like this uh, loop magnetic field and also like the matter state can actually uh, forming this. But maybe if I actually evolve the 3D simulation for a longer time and um, oh. make it go to the like matter state for a longer time, uh, it would be interesting to see if this inner force is being formed or not. I'm, I'm also curious about it, yeah. Yes, Mariana. Maybe it's technical, but in that, <clears throat> in the same line, do your simulations have like a zoom in adaptive degree? Because I remember your numbers were like 256 degree points, but mm -hmm. could it be possible, I don't know if it is even possible, then to refine this mesh and then focus on the, 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 these interesting parts that you want to see? Is something possible for you? Yeah, we don't have like this adaptive mesh refinement technique, okay. but uh, yeah, the, the grid is actually the grid spacing is not uniform. So, yeah, uh, yeah so basically, yeah. Uh, I don't I don't have actually like, um, no, it, but okay, so um, because you know, uh, like the for the initial configuration, the disk is really actually. Uh, Basically, yeah. on the equator, yeah, so you don't want to see everything on this axis, of course. Yeah, so so for that reason, we are using actually some sort of mass for our coordinate mm -hmm. systems, so that would squish the grid points toward the equator, and also we use some uh, logarithmic map for the radius part. So basically, we have more resolution close to the black one and also more resolution. Uh, on the equator. Okay, so it's sort of an adaptive in the sense that you're focusing, but not really that the mesh is being refined. Okay. Yes, yes, but yeah, for, for those kind of this mesh refinement techniques, they are like actively during the evolution. They adopt this, yes. Uh, refinement, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, maybe from Zoom? Um, I'm not sure if people on Zoom could have some question or comments. Can you check? If not, then we can finish. No. So thank you again.